Okay, cool. All right, and I will share my screen. All right, I think we'll probably just get started. <laughs> um, welcome to everyone uh, who's joining us live right now to the Global Media uh, Policy Seminar Series. This is an online seminar series jointly organized between the Program in Comparative Media Law and Policy at the University of Oxford and the School of Communication at the University of Johannesburg. The series features insights on pressing issues affecting new media and human rights, particularly at the margins. We live stream these talks online to help bridge the gap between conversations happening in the global north and the global south on today's most important media debates. We hope you'll continue to join us for future seminars. You can sign up by visiting the PCMLP website, which should pop up here in a moment. Yes, uh, or tune in live on YouTube at PCMLP Oxford, which should be on the screen right now. Today we'll be taking questions here on Zoom, so please use the Q&A function uh, available in your Zoom window. And if you're watching on the live stream, please just tweet, uh, tweet your questions to at Oxford Media Law mm -hmm. on Twitter, and I'll be keeping an eye on the Twitter feed as well. So that covers all our basic logistics for now. So I will stop sharing my screen. Um, just by way of some brief introductions, um, I'm Kira Allman. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in media law and policy at the University of Oxford in the Center for Sociolegal Studies. And I am delighted to be introducing our guest speaker today, Philip Ressler. Philip Ressler is the Margaret Hamilton Associate Professor of Government at the College of William & Mary, which is my undergraduate university. So I'm especially happy to have him with us here today. He's an expert in the study of African political economy with wide ranging interests on the causes of conflict, spatial inequality, and the developmental impact of mobile technology. With the support of a 2019 Grand Challenges Call to Action grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, he is currently leading a research team to study the impact of smartphones and their cooperative use within the household on economic well-being in Malawi. His talk today is titled, Technology Does Not Operate in a Vacuum, The Impact of Women's Mobile Phone Ownership on Economic Well-Being in Tanzania. Thanks so much for joining us today. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Phil. Thank you, Kira. Thanks so much uh, for having me. Really look forward to just talking with everyone today uh, about our research on the impact of mobile phone ownership uh, on economic well-being, uh, in this case, on the focus on, with focus on Tanzania. Shall I share my screen? Can you see that here? Yeah, can see it just fine, it's perfect. Perfect. Yeah, so um, we're all very familiar, of course, with the, the mobile phone revolution. And I know this seminar series has, has explored uh, new media, including um, you know, the use of smartphones uh, and digital technology and its interaction uh, with with media. In this talk, I want to think about the mobile phone revolution um, and think of it from kind of a bottom-up perspective, uh, you know, how it's impacting the lives of, um, in this case, low-income households uh, in Tanzania. We're all beneficiaries of the mobile phone revolution and its kind of transformative impacts. It's, you know, helped us all improve our long-distance communication, made it easier, easier for us to acquire market information, uh, to do financial uh, transactions uh, and to, you know, access uh, financial institutions. And, and these kind of gains and benefits from the mo mobile phone revolution uh, are going to be especially strong for those who have faced barriers uh, to these types of activities, right? So if you lived, um, you know, in, in a place where you didn't have fixed line telephones, right, or you didn't have a bank account, Right? or it was difficult to get access to market, inf market information without spending a lot of money on kind of transportation costs, the mobile phone has the potential to you know, uh, unlock these very important kind of mechanisms that are important for everyone's livelihoods. And there's been a, a lot of research, uh, of course, on the mobile phone revolution, 
with a focus on mobile money, right? And, and mobile money is, is the use of uh, a phone, you know, basic handset, a smartphone uh, to store and share uh, money, right? Uh, you know, revolutionized in Kenya with the use of M-Pesa. It is spread uh, around the world, especially uh, in East Africa. And, you know, there's been great work, um, you know, by Surrey Jack, by Jenny Aker, uh, you know, by others showing just how important mobile money is, you know, for, the, for those who, who don't have a bank account, how it helps people to protect themselves from economic shocks, uh, how it, you know, potentially increases mobility, uh, increases one's, um, you know, uh, uh, economic capabilities, let's say market, market, as market traders. But we're also very familiar that you know, kind of very persistent and pernicious inequalities persist uh, in terms of mobile phone access and use. Uh, you know, there's you know, differences based on age, there are differences based on economic, uh, you know, socioeconomic status, and there are differences uh, based on, on gender. And the gender gap is you know, something we wanna focus on here on in our research. We've seen that closing over time um, but you know, the, the, the latest research from Connected Women at GSMA suggests that uh, the narrowing may be, you know, may be you know, stopping, right? That the, the gap is no longer shrinking, but it's, it's now stabilized uh, in which you know, across many low and middle income countries, you know, women are, are, are just you know, remaining behind in terms of um, owning a mobile phone. Uh, and the, the, you know, the, the gap in mobile internet use, mobile money use are even more severe than in mobile phone use. So our research, you know, we want to better understand what are the costs and consequences of this digital divide. Uh, and we've been working on this research program uh, with the research organization, uh, Rapoa, one of the leading research uh, institutes in Tanzania uh, to, to address this que question. You know, what is the, the cost and consequences of the gender gap in mobile phone ownership? Uh, and we've been studying this using field experiments, uh, working with women who don't own phones and providing them cost-free with mobile technology and the training, you know, basic training on how to use this, uh, this incredible technology. And we've started very slow, uh, start, you know, very incrementally, starting with, a, you know, already, you know, more than five years ago, we started with a pilot project, um, uh, collaborating with a social enterprise, Kodogo Kodogo, uh, working with women who didn't own phones, providing them with phones, looking at, uh, at the feasibility of this type of uh, programming. We saw a lot of demand, you know, not surprisingly, for such programming. And we saw that this was an incredible tool to also learn uh, what is the, the, the cost of this gender gap? What are the benefits, the impact of mitigating it, right? getting hand, mobile phones in the hands of women. And we slowly uh, you know, increased our sample size, they increased the number of people we're, we were working with. And thanks to support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we were able to field a, a very large experimental study to look at the impact of getting mobile phones uh, on the hands, in the hands of, of women. So what I wanna do today is talk about what we did uh, what was the design of our, our research study, and what were the key findings and the implications of our research? Uh, and, and happy to then take questions about, uh, you know, about it. So the large scale field experiment we did, which was done in 2016, 2017, really over the course of uh, you know, a year and a half, two years in terms of you know, planning, uh, preparation, implementation, uh, the, the experiment itself was run for 13 months. And it occurred across different regions of Tanzania. As you can see from this map, we had you know, all major regions of um, or the different you know, zones of Tanzania covered. We, you know, we had coastal regions, we had the breadbasket uh, in Oringa, we had you know, areas around Arusha and then areas around Mwanza. We worked with two organizations in Tanzania to recruit participants. Uh, we, we ran two different experiments. One among non-phone owners. So we screened women for mobile phone ownership. Uh, they didn't, you know, this is part of a baseline survey. They didn't know kind of the nature of our, our questions or you know, the purpose of, 
asking them about mobile phone ownership. So we have no reason to believe that they, um, you know, answered this question about mobile phone ownership, you know, in you know, any ways anticipating getting a phone. So we had a pretty good screening procedure to determine whether an individual owned a phone or not. And if they didn't own a phone, they were then eligible to be part of our program. Um, and then some women did own a phone. And so we had a smaller uh, second study of phone owners. Today, I want to, I want to focus on this uh, research study among non-phone owners, right? And we recruited these women from two organizations, BRAC, a microfinance organization that I, I think many uh, are probably familiar with. So BRAC works with uh, women to provide them with microfinance loans. Uh, they, um, you know, many of these were small business owners, uh, re re relatively well-educated women, uh, but at this time they did not own a phone. And then we're, we also worked with the Tanzania Social Action Fund, which is a, a safety net to the poorest in Tanzania. So these women will be poorer than the, uh, the women from the BRAC sample. Uh, they also did not you know, own a phone. BRAC and TASIF had offices in the five regions we were working. Uh, working with Rapoa, we explained the nature uh, of our program. And then we uh, reached out to participants um, you know, to, to um, initially survey them. And then after surveying, uh, seek their you know, uh, consent to be part of this mobile phone program study. Um, and the, the study itself was as an experiment. So some will receive the phone and some uh, will not. And this was done via lottery, but this was a waitlist design. So everyone eventually received a phone uh, or a, a cash grant, which I'll talk about as part of the study. It was just, it was a two year program. So some received the phone in year one and then others received the phone in year two. And a waitlist design um, is, is very good for equity. Right, so you know there are distributional consequences when it comes to uh, running an experiment. You know, some get the intervention, some not. A waitlist design is an equitable uh, way to make sure everyone gets the, um, in this case, you know, the intervention, which is uh, the phone. Right, so uh, we we um, asked people if they were interested in this mobile phone program. We asked them, you know, we told them that as part of this program, they would be eligible to receive a phone. And we told them that uh, some would receive the phone in year one and some would receive the phone in, a, in the year two. And it would be determined by lottery as to what year uh, one received the phone. And based on our previous work, we knew that participants thought this was fair to use a lottery to determine uh, the ordering of the allocation of phones. So after getting consent for participants to be in the study, we then, uh, we then um, assign them to uh, one of four conditions, as I've mentioned. One, the control group, right? So they would receive the handset at the end of the study. Uh, another condition was to receive a basic phone. Uh, and this was a Samsung uh, B B110. So these are women, again, who don't have a phone uh, at the time of the study. They might have owned a phone before, but at the time of the study, they did not own a phone. We provided them with a Samsung handset. And then others received a smartphone, um, a Huawei Y3C smartphone. And then we also had what we called um, a, a cash placebo condition. So roughly the same value as the basic handset, we provided people uh, with a, a small cash grant, um, you know, to, to try to compare, well, what's the best, you know, is it more efficacious to give someone a, a phone or give them cash, which is the same value of uh, you know, the, the phone and see what they do with the, the cash. Uh, you know, um, what ended up happening is those who received the cash grant, many of them ended up uh, buying phones with the cash grant. So it, uh, it was not necessarily a good placebo, right? Because we, um, you know, many people then went out and bought phones, perhaps primed, uh, you know, by our study. They knew this was a mobile phone study. Maybe thought, oh yeah, a mobile phone, uh, yeah, I, I could really use one, benefit from, I see other people are receiving one, maybe I should buy one. So in the future, it would be nice um, you know, to do a, a follow-up study in which we have kind of a, 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 a maybe more pure placebo uh, and, and they're not informed about the, the broader study. Okay, so a little bit of background on the participants. So these 
tended to be older women, right? So the average age of women in Tanzania is you know, probably in the low 30s. So these are older women, um, lower levels of literacy. You know, they, these are kind of the, the, the bottom half of you know, kind of the socioeconomic distribution in Tanzania. Many are farmers. Um, you know, two thirds are married. Those who were not married, uh, many were widowed. Uh, at baseline, these households had less than one phone uh, in the household, right? So, you know, they had about, you know, close to a phone in the household uh, and that phone was not owned by these women participants, but someone else, uh, often their spouses. So Tanzania, you know, neighbors Kenya, as I mentioned, M-Pesa kind of set this mobile money revolution that has spread into Tanzania. So mobile money is quite uh, active and prevalent uh, in uh, Tanzania. And so we saw that at baseline, you know, almost a quarter of the participants reported owning a, a mobile money account, but kind of, you know, infrequent use of, of that account. So one big question we had was, well, if you, you know, how much is owning a phone a constraint to using mobile money? So our study, you know, the key aims were, uh, you know, supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is very much interested in, in better understanding how we can increase uptake and use of digital financial services. We wanted to understand the journey from mobile phone ownership to use of digital financial services. You know, in, in this case, mobile money, right? You know, given the, the, the benefits of mobile money, uh, it's more secure, uh, you, you know, potentially one can, you know, build up a credit, uh, it makes it easier to receive remittances. It reduces, you know, tr potentially travel costs, makes it easier as a farmer to market your vegetables um, and, and, you know, other, you know, goods that you might be selling. You know, we wanted to see if their uh, livelihood benefits could be achieved from having a mobile phone. And then if that works through uptake and use of digital financial services. So we're interested in, in that outcome. And then we're also interested in the, the impact this has on the household's economic well-being, right? There's a you know, strong expectation and hope that the mobile phone revolution is reducing poverty, right? And, and Surrey and Jack in their study in Kenya, looking at the diffusion and spread of mobile money does find strong effects on poverty reduction. Uh, so here we're looking at, well, what's the impact of a phone itself on household economic well-being. So I'll start with looking at the, um, this, the impact of mobile phone ownership on uptake of mobile money. Right? And we measure uptake of mobile money in, in several different ways, right? So we've, you know, after we've done the distribution of the phones uh, and that distribution of the phones uh, in, you know, included a basic training instruction uh, on how to use the phone, Given the number of participants, we did not have uh, the opportunity to provide very in-depth training, right? These were not extensive training workshops. Uh, instead, it was something that would, you know, maybe simulate the type of information and instruction you would get when you yourself bought a phone, right? So you receive your phone, you receive a certificate showing that you are now the owner of this phone, right? So these were, you know, women, part of Brack and Tassif. Uh, they came to this, uh, you know, phone program. They received the phone a certificate uh, establishing their ownership, uh, some basic instruction, and then you know they went on their way. And we followed up with them at six months, and we followed up at thirteen months. Um, and you know, and of course, we followed up with all you know the difference, you know, all the participants in the study, those in control, those in the. Um, the you know the 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 cash placebo and, and the, the study the treatment groups and if you remember it was a wait list design so those in the control group they received their phones after the end line survey right um you know so we told them they would get that a year two and it would be uh you know at least 12 months out so by end line the the differences we're looking at are those in the treatment groups who've now had a phone uh, or, or received a phone, you know, uh, more than 13 months ago. And those in the control group 
at the time of the study did not have a phone. So what is the impact of, of uh, receiving a phone 13 months ago? So we wanna look at the impact on uptake and use of mobile money. Uh, you know, at our N-Line survey, we asked them about mobile money use. Um, and you know, that, that's, that's useful, but of course there are limitations to uh, you know, self-reported responses and survey questions. Uh, participants might, you know, you know uh, be affected by social desirability bias, might be telling us what we want to hear. So we also had a behavioral measure uh, of mobile money use. And, and we did this through what we call a digital, on the spot digital payments test. And we offered participants on the spot a, a micro grant. Uh, and it was around $2 if they took the grant in cash. And it was more than double that if they accepted this small grant via mobile money, right? And our, our research team, our, our field assistants, they had cash on hand and they had a phone so they could send uh, the respondent mobile money on the spot, right? So we would, we would pay them this micro grant on the spot. And, and given that the 100% premium, if they took mobile money, we had, um, we gave them strong incentives, you know, to take mobile money, right? So if you're using mobile money, you know, you have a mobile money account, you're fluent in mobile money use, we would really expect you to uh, use mobile money. If you didn't, you'd probably, you know, be more likely uh, to take the cash. So we thought this was a good way to ascertain whether you actually use mobile money, you know, beyond what you tell us uh, in a survey. And at Endline, we only ran it, um, uh, you know, with the premium being 100%, but at our midline and in previous studies, we varied the amount. Uh, so we could see, well, how much do people, you know, uh, want cash versus mobile money? So not surprisingly, when, when cash, uh, was the same as mobile money value or cash was higher, vir virtually everyone takes cash, right? Now, when mobile money was higher, what we see is that when there's a 33% mobile money, right? We're paying you 33% more to take mobile money. Only 7% take mobile money. When we increase that premium to 80%, right? We're, we're literally paying you an 80% premium to take mobile money still only 47% take mobile money in general across all the participants. And then when we you know, doubled it, uh, we did the end line, we offered you 100% premium to take mobile money, right? We're paying them to take mobile money, still only 56% uh, you know, take you know, uh, mobile money, nearly half still prefer cash you know, and foregoing the benefits that they would get from mobile money. So I, we think this is an important corrective. Now this was you know, already three years ago and the mobile money revolution it continues to, to move very quickly, especially you know, accelerated by the pandemic. Um, but it, it's worth considering, I mean, Tanzania is one of the more advanced digital economies, but there's still friction for low income households to uh, use mobile money uh, uh, compared to cash. Right, and, and why didn't they take mobile money? Uh, well, you can probably, probably guess well, some of the constraints. One, maybe they anticipated the fees to cash out were higher than they are, right? So they don't understand the fee structure. You know, 100% premium, you know, the, the, you know, the, you're, you're still going to make uh, you know, a very large return if you choose mobile money. Uh, liquidity constraints, right? I need the money in cash right now. Um, you know, also, you know, participants not having a phone. So what we saw in terms of our treatment groups, right, that not, not surprisingly, those in the phone conditions were much more likely to choose mobile money and importantly to, to have mobile money sent to their own mobile money account, right? So when we do the on-the-spot digital payments test, we ask them if they choose mobile money, we, 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 we uh, get their SIM card so we can send them the transfer right there and then. And we ask them whose mobile money account is that, right? And so we know whether the participant is receiving the money on their own account or not. And what we see is that having a mobile phone, 
right? Whether you're in the basic phone or the smartphone group compared to the control, we see they're much more likely to choose mobile money and have it sent to their own account, right? So, so this is what we would expect, right? Uh, that, you know, this is confirming the importance of having women having uh, their own phone increases their control of mobile money and, and their use, right? But we, you know, we still see kind of, um, you know, that a lot don't choose mobile money for the reasons we said. Now, interestingly, we had two conditions uh, in the phone condition. We had a basic handset condition and smart, smartphone condition. Uh, and interestingly, on the, on the spot mobile money test, we sat, see that the basic phone outperformed the smartphone. And this effect seems to be driven by literacy, right? Um, that those in the smartphone condition who had lower levels of literacy, their uptake of uh, mobile money was lower than in the, in the, the basic phone. So this, this does suggest that, um, you know, as transformative the smartphone is, uh, that for lower literacy populations, it might not be suited uh, as well than as the basic phone. You know, and, and sometimes we might expect the opposite, right? That maybe the, the, um, the smartphone with its touch interface, uh, you know, that with voice calls and, and voice messaging, uh, audio messaging might actually favor uh, and be more beneficial for low literacy populations. But when it came to mobile money, we see that the basic handset performed better than the smartphone um, for low literacy populations. Um, and, you know, so we see some change in behavior, uh, you know, definitely uptake of mobile money is higher uh, when one has their own phone. We see a significant increase in use, preferring to use their mobile money account to save rather than under the mattress. But we still see, if you look at this chart here, um, you know, the control group, you know, more than 75% prefer to save under the mattress. Those in the phone groups, it's lower than that, significantly lower, but still, right? I mean, um, you know, 65, close to, uh, you know, 70% are still preferring to save under the mattress, right? So changing financial behavior, you know, is slow and incremental. Uh, you know, mobile phone ownership and control is important, uh, but it, um, you know, this, this doesn't happen overnight, right? So what about the impact on household economic well-being, right? So we see these gains at the individual level. What about at the household level? And here we use consumption module to measure uh, household economic well-being, right? So it's a basket, we have 15 baskets. How much is the household spending on uh, you know, mobile uh, phones themselves on food, on healthcare, on school fees, education, uh, on transportation, a whole host of different, uh, you know, common consumption baskets. Uh, and we use this uh, as a, a measure of the living standard of the household, right? And we have this for all participants at baseline, and then we have this at end line, and we want to compare living standard of those in the phone groups to those in the control group. And what we see is, qu is quite striking, uh, is we see that those in the phone groups have a report, you know, on this consumption module, uh, report, report spending 20% more on household consumption, right? So a 20% increase in their living standard. And this is especially in the smartphone group, right? Now this is at the household level, now the mobile money test was at the individual level. This is at the household level. We see that the smartphone is uh, really in driving gains in consumption, uh, you know, um, you know as, a, as a measure of kind of living standard. And this is, an, we see an amplifying effect of the intervention, right? The, the gains in consumption are three times the cost of the handset itself. Uh, and then double the cost of the whole intervention, which for, you know is the cost of the phone, and then distribution of the phones themselves, right? So this is th these are very strong uh, effects. This is intention to treat effect. So this is the average effect treatment effect 
of just being assigned to the smartphone condition, right? If you, you know, if you 13 months ago, you were randomly assigned to the smartphone condition and you received a smartphone as part of our program, you know, more than a year later, your household has is, is 20% more consumption. Uh, and, and some of this is spending on the phone itself. Uh, but even we exclude spending on the phone itself, we also see you know, near 20% increase in consumption. And this is not just driven by spending more on one basket. It's across a number of different baskets. So we see more on transportation, right? So this may, maybe points to kind of more mobility. You know, and there's debates in the literature whether having a phone um, kind of reduces transportation costs. But our, our study suggests it may increase mobility and increased investing in transportation. We see increasing investment in schooling and health, um, entertainment, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, but also contributions to community activities and ceremonies, right? So maybe this is a social network effect, right? You now have this phone, you're more, you're more networked and connected to the community. Uh, you're more likely to make contributions to community activities. Maybe it's a status, you know, uh, effect. You know, maybe it's a you know, mobile money effect uh, in which you're, there's an expectation that you contribute more to communities activities, but there's significantly increased spending across these um, baskets. Now, now, a couple of things here. This smartphone effects are not due to selling this phone, right? And in, in fact, it's due to the women's control of the phone. So at the end of the study, we asked the women whether they still own the phone that we gave them and whether they can show us the phone. And these consumption gains are among those who own the phone and show us the phone. It is not due to selling the phone. You know, those who don't have the phone um, are, are no better off than control. So th this effect goes through the phone. And it also seems to be driven by cooperative intra-household use. So what do we mean that, by that? Well, at the end of the study, those in the phone group, we asked them, who besides you used the phone? And when they report that their husbands also use the smartphone, we see that consumption gains were particularly high, right? So, so this, this consumption gains were from receiving this phone, women's control of the phone, but also uh, reporting that the husband also used the phone. And again, not surprising because at baseline, this household had less than one phone and it was not a smartphone. Now they receive a smartphone and it lifts the household, uh, you know, increases their living standards. And it seems to be when both the husband and wife uh, use the phone together. Um, on the other hand, if, we, if it's reported that the husband confiscated the phone, um, you know, took it and the women never, no longer used it, uh, the household was, was worse off. And, and intriguingly, when they reported their sons were the ones who used the phone the most besides them, the household was also worse off compared to baseline. Um, and this, this suggests the, phone, the sons see a smartphone, uh, you know, somehow get their hands on it and then you know, use it maybe for their own you know, devices, but it's not for the benefit of the household. Um, so, so this is important to think about the household dynamic and structures affecting how mobile technology uh, you know, affects the, the, the household, right? I'm gonna come back to this point. Now, overall, we see that this, you know, the smartphones ha deliver this extremely strong welfare uh, effect for participants, but, um, by the end of the study, 30% no longer own any phone at all, right? And this, this surprised us, right? So these are people in this, the phone conditions. A year ago, they received a phone. They received basic handset or smartphone. And we asked them a year later, do you own a phone? And those in the phone group, you know, only 70% said they own a phone. 30% said they did not own a phone. So this was a lot more phone loss than we anticipated. We anticipated some, but not nearly this level. Um, and what you see is that the, you know, the loss of the smartphone was higher than 
the basic phone. Um, and, and it's important to note that this phone loss was not a free phone effect. So one concern is that we give you a free phone, right? It's yours to use as you deem fit, but you know, you, you, you know, because you didn't pay for it, maybe you didn't value it uh, as, as much as if you bought the phone yourself. But in fact, we see that those in the cash group, if you recall, those in the cash group also bought a phone. Many of them bought a phone, but they also didn't retain the phone um, as, you know, at, they lost the phone at a similar, if not higher rate than the phone group, right? So this is a general effect in which we see these low income households having um, kind of irregular phone use. You know, we, we take for granted that mobile phones are ubiquitous, that mobile phone penetration rates are, you know, increasing exponentially, that everyone owns a phone. But what we're missing from this kind of this, the big picture, um, you, know, you know, from, you know, maybe the forest, the, at, the, at the individual level, there's a lot of turnover in, uh, you know, phone ownership. And that, you know, those who lost their phone at six months into our study, 90% who lost the phone by end line still did not have a phone, right? So those at, you know, uh, in low income households, when you lose your phone or you do not retain it, it takes months, if not more than a year to get you know, enough resources to buy a new phone. Uh, and, and we think this perspective of this irregular phone ownership is, is missing, uh, you know, or we, we assume it happens and, and um, you know, don't you know, uh, think about it or consider it. So what, what explains why women retain the phone or not? So one is age. Right. Um, so if you're younger, women are less likely to retain the phone. Right. So maybe this is a function of kind of agency and power where younger women lack that, um, you know, the, 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 the power to, to to retain the phone. The other the other dynamic is a no phone in the household. Right. So if this is if if this phone that the, the woman is receiving is the only phone in the household, we do see they're less likely to retain it suggesting maybe someone else in the household is taking it. What really surprised us is the microfinance members were less likely to retain the phone. In our study, the microfinance participants were much better off than the other participants. And we would expect them to have the wherewithal, the demand to, to want to keep a phone, but they did not retain it. And we, and we were thinking, well, why wouldn't they keep the phone? And we thought, well, maybe is it is it possible that those in the microfinance group have higher levels of debt and they have to sell the phone to pay off the debt? And we checked the, the, the loan data we had and those in the microfinance group who had outstanding loans at the start of the study were more likely not to keep their phone, suggesting they were, they, they were selling it. So unfortunately, this is kind of the dark side of microfinance story uh, in which indebtedness uh, leads to selling a technology which can, um, you know, help you over, you know, kind of lift yourself out, out of poverty. So, um, and this matters, right? You know, not being able to retain a phone, losing the phone matters a lot, as we would expect, right? You're, you're pretty much no, no better off than control if you, um, if you lose the, the handset. So what are the kind of the big takeaways from this, our, our, our research, and, and what, what can we, you know, kind of discuss here in the last 20 minutes? Well, one, you know, consistent with the title of the talk, um, you know, this is, we all know mobile technology does not operate in a vacuum, right? Uh, we, we all know that it's very dangerous to, um, to see technology as kind of this silver bullet and this panacea. Nonetheless, it's very seductive for us to think about technological solutions, right? Um, in our study, we see just how important the existing social and economic structures are for mobile phone ownership. That is whether you know, a woman owns a phone, uses it, controls it, and keeps it. And you know, we don't think about retention as much as we should. Uh, and in our study, it's very stark. We literally see these structural factors you know, taking the phone away, right? 
you know, we see younger women, you know, maybe lacking the agency to keep, you know, to, to keep the phone. We see women, um, you know, where this is the only phone in the household, kind of, you know, the control slipping from their grasp. And if it's used by the son, taken by the son, the household's worse off, right? Or by the husband, and they don't use it cooperatively, the household's worse off. And then, you know, the poverty trap, right? You know, many women, especially maybe those who, who are indebted, they have to sell the phone, right? And they, you know, to meet short-term financial hardship, and they forego the long run gains that come from, you know, mobile phone ownership, right? So our study starkly shows the benefits of ownership uh, and the, uh, the consequences of loss and turnover. And, and we can't take for granted exponential increases in mobile phone ownership are gonna lead to continuous ownership, right? All of our programming around the world is based on mobile phone ownership whether it's in informational interventions, media, um, you, know, you know, development programming, government, you know, to, you, know, to, um, you know, to people kind of interventions, payments. We take for granted that people have um, a mobile phone and can connect and benefit these programs, but, but it's among low-income households, uh, that's a dangerous assumption. Many are becoming connected and then disconnected, and not just as disconnected for a week or two weeks, but for months on end, and that's a, a, a big setback, um, right? And, and, and our study shows uh, the type of irregular ownership that exists. Now, phone loss, you know, need not lead to such severe setbacks, um, right? You know. The, the beauty of the phone is uh, mobile phone revolution is that the SIM card alone, very cheap SIM card can keep you connected. Um, but when you lose your phone, you often lose your SIM card or don't retain it or don't use it. And people become disconnected. Um, critical to better understand the dynamics at the household level and mobile phone ownership. Um, and in our study, you know, the, 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 the smartphone delivered incredible household welfare gains. When, and, and, and this seems to have occurred when the husband and, and wife used the phone cooperatively, right? Um, you know, cooperation, uh, you, know, it, you know, existing cooperation is there. Uh, and I think we're just not tapping into it as much as we, as we, we can and should. Uh, and we also have to think, well, how can we develop new norms around cooperative use, right? Um, and the last kind of, you know, learning is the value of field experiments. Um, not just to give us really good causal identification, right? These are some of the first causal estimates of the impact of mobile phone ownership. But also the, the nice thing about experiments is it, it helps us and forces us to do very careful process tracing, right? The intervention here is the phone. Right? Did you receive the phone? Did you receive um, you know, the, the treatment? Do, did you continue to take the treatment? We have to carefully track whether you uh, continue to take the treatment. And this led to careful process tracing around mobile phone ownership. And that delivered these insights that we have uh, this mobile phone turnover. Okay, so just to conclude, next steps, we're in the middle of replicating our study in Tanzania in Malawi, right? So it's smartphones versus control condition. And we're, we're one innovation for this, this replication is to focus more on norms around women's ownership and control of, of technology, right? So this, the, the impact of the phone, um, you know, in the, where it was used cooperatively, that's gonna be a function of kind of very deep rooted social and economic structures in the household. You know, as we well know, those don't change. Those are hard to change. They change very slowly. But it is worth considering with this new technology, right? You know, with a smartphone, can at the, the moment in which one receives this in the household, whether there's an opportunity to develop new norms, um, you know, or expose people to ideas about, you know, uh, own, who's, you know, ownership rights for women, prop, you know, property rights, but also cooperative use. So we're working with uh, the Gender Empowerment Network of Malawi. 
um, and Jeanette, and they've developed this really uh, exciting and innovative couples training program around smartphones in which we are laying out clear property rights that these smartphones are the women's, right? They have, you know, they are receiving them as part of this program and they are the owners and we certify they are the owners and, and everyone acknowledges in this community setting and you can see this photograph of the community setting that the women are the ones receiving this phone and it is their phone. Um, right, so we think that should strengthen their their property rights around ownership, and we think that's important because in Tanzania, when the women are the ones controlling the phone, we see the greatest gains for the household. But of course, it's also important that the women uh, share the household, the, the handset with the household, right, with their husbands to maximize the benefit. So we want to encourage shared use, uh, and we think that these things go together that the women will be more likely to share the phone uh, and work with their husbands if they know that they have strong property rights and that this phone will not be then appropriated from them. Uh, and we think this will lead to kind of a, a, a more cooperative, uh, you know, kind of ecosystem in which both husbands and wives will benefit together. Uh, and we also want to encourage them to teach each other about how to use that technology. So we're into, you know, we're, we're doing this study now. We have a control group, a smartphone group where they, the women just receive the phone and then the smartphone plus couples training. So we can isolate the benefit of couples training and developing new norms uh, around uh, cooperative smartphone use. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it there uh, and, and welcome any questions or, or comments or suggestions for our, our research program. Thank you, thank you so much. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Phil, for that great talk. Um, there are just so many interesting things to unpack there. Um, the the field experiment model that you've uh, developed um, just is really fascinating. And it seems like there are potentially myriad applications of that particular methodological approach. And so I'm curious to see if um, anyone who's tuning in has any questions about that in particular. Um, and I, I just wanna ask, because I know that you work a lot with um, research assistants who are undergraduates. So kind of just to, to get started in terms of that methodological side of things, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, um, how, how you actually roll this out in the field. You mentioned the partnerships that you build locally, but um, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about the research process and what it's like working with undergrads. Yeah, um, thanks, Kira. That's a great question. And, you know, something we're very, very proud of, uh, William and Mary, and I'm, I'm sure you remember uh, yourself uh, as an undergrad, uh, we value faculty-student collaboration, um, and we very much see students as collaborators. Uh, and when we were first coming up with this research idea, it was in a class taught, with my, uh, taught by my uh, good friend, Dan Nielsen, who was vi visiting from Brigham Young University. And he taught a class on field experiments and development. And I sat in on the class and so did undergraduates. Uh, and we, we had a, a, a research group, um, you know, like a group project and me and five students and, and Dan uh, thought about this uh, project. And it was at that time that we connected with Flora Mayamba, a sociologist, uh, you know, working on women's empowerment in Tanzania. And we, we were exchanging ideas, the students, Flora, me, Dan, uh, about the, the potential of better understanding the impact of the mobile phone revolution. Uh, and so what was great was um, students were involved from every step of the process. And then I uh, organized a course, you know, following Dan's model, uh, a field experiments course where students sat in on my class, they learned the method, and then they would um, work with Rapoa over the summer to help with implementation. Uh, and likewise, Flora and Rapoa, they do something very similar uh, where, where they mentor young people, really uh, you know, bright, young, uh, impressive young people who work as field assistants so you saw Stella in one of the photographs, you could see Stella doing an interview with a part I mean, just really incredible way they have of connecting with um, participants. Uh, and, and, and so we, we also benefited from the young people in Tanzania. I know what's great is our students and the Rapoa uh, students 
you know, you had to get to know each other. So it's, it's great cross-cultural uh, exchange. Um, so it's a really nice model. Uh, and we've, we thank Rapoa. They're, they're a, a fantastic institution and, and, and they do great mentorship. Uh, and we thank them for, um, you know, the, the great collaboration. That's awesome. That's great. Thanks for, uh, thanks for explaining that a little bit more. Um, and relatedly, it sounds like quite a lot of the information that you get uh, about how, especially at, um, sort of later on in the experiment, how, how women have been using the phones comes from uh, interviews. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, how, how do you come up with sort of the battery of interview questions that, mm -hmm. that you ask um, in order to kind of uh, get to the roots of, for instance, that issue of phone loss, which was, mm -hmm. um, I thought, quite interesting because there are many different reasons why, um, why some participants wound up not having a phone at the end and getting to the actually the, the root cause of that would be challenging, I would imagine, mm -hmm. in, a, in an interview setting. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So that's a great question. So we, um, we've been working, uh, you know, this was an incremental process, as I said. So we started with this pilot, you know, 50 people. Um, and that was around Dar es Salaam. And so in our, you know, first pilot experiment, we're also, you know, to measure impact, we rely on baseline surveys and midline and endline surveys. Um, so working and Rapoa is an expert on survey methodology. They do um, the Afrobarometer survey, which some people may be familiar with, which is a really great uh, countrywide survey done in a number of African countries, including Tanzania. So we um, fine tuned our survey through the course of these three different phases, you know, each time thinking about, um, you know, you know, uh, you know, are these questions capturing what we, we think they're capturing, how they're understood by our participants. I must also say what's great in this field is people are very generous to share their surveys. Uh, and, you know, I emailed, uh, you know, um, Tevneet Suri and Billy Jack about their survey they used in, in Kenya, and they were very generous to share their survey instrument. So it's, it's very great, um, you know, this community of researchers are collaborative, they're willing to share survey instruments. So we benefited from that and then from, um, um, you know, piloting, we, you know, very important to pilot and testing in Malawi right now, we're in the middle of piloting our survey uh, to make sure we get it, get it right. Now there, there, there are limits of course, to survey research. You know, these are closed ended questions. So we also did in-depth qualitative interviews with 40 plus people, which were really illuminating. Um, and in which our enumerators sat down for, you know, uh, half a day with the participants to better understand, uh, you know, what, what, how they understood ownership, what happened to their phone. I mean, you know, we, kept, and we, better, we better learned like what it meant when they didn't retain the phone or lost it. And, you know, you, uh, you hear stories about people dropping their phone, you know, and the, uh, you know, retrieving water and the, you had a water source, you know, you get, and it, it, it's important because you know, we shouldn't forget like, you know, these are, you know, real lives and then this matters a lot. Uh, and so it's important, the kind of the depth of learning from qualitative interviews, um, but, you know, also kind of the human side of this research, which I think is, is really important. Yes, absolutely. Um, actually, before we carry on, I was wondering if perhaps, Phil, you could just stop sharing your screen oh, yeah, um, so we can see you a bit bigger for the last like 10 minutes or so of the, um, of the Q&A. Sure, um, that, sure. That's wonderful. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just kind of, uh, I was wondering a bit about um, the difference between uh, the, the basic phones and the smartphones. I know you were particularly focused on, um, on mobile money, yeah. but I'm wondering if uh, you looked at all at issues of internet use mm -hmm. um, or, uh, or maybe the purchase of data plans, for instance, when people had access to a smartphone or access to, um, to internet resources. Did that come up at all in, in the course of that experiment? Yes, it did. Uh, so, um, we saw significant increases in mobile internet use, right, with the smartphone. Not surprising. That's as we would as we would expect. Um, but it, it it what's important though is that these were like you know um, really dramatic increases, but such a low base, uh, you know, that it wasn't increasing the smart uh, internet use as much as I forget exactly how much, but it was you know uh, those 
in the smartphone group, it was, it was still quite infrequent use, right? So among this sample, uh, we were just not seeing a lot of um, mobile internet uh, use. Now in Malawi, we are, um, we're gonna provide a more intensive training around the phones. We have a bit more capacity. Uh, we have a bit more, you know, investing a bit more resources to provide better training. And we're going to um, uh, download uh, WhatsApp. So Malawi, WhatsApp is, is you know, very, very common as the, um, you know, the kind of the messaging app of choice. And already in our pilot, uh, among these low literacy populations, there was a lot of excitement around the internet phone, which they call it, but also for WhatsApp. And in our pilot, um, they were corresponding with one of our research managers and they were sending her uh, voice messages. They really like WhatsApp because you can do it pretty cheap on the using data and you could send voice messages, right? So for low literacy populations, they really you know, enjoyed this feature. So we didn't see that much uptake of what's happened in Tanzania, um, but it'll be interesting to see in, in Malawi that kind of uh, effect um, because we're going to try to um, download that app on the phone uh, and demonstrate how to use that. Okay, yeah, really interesting. Um, I, I have a follow-up question about that, but we actually had a question come in while you're speaking, so I'll ask you that first. Um, from Sarah, who would like to know, uh, she says, um, I've met a young woman, or, sorry, I've met young women with low incomes and mobile phones in Rwanda. I imagined that these phones were sold at a very low cost, say 20 pounds, in order to develop the market for those phones. Why are such phones more expensive in the UK and do uh, non-African people resent, resent the price difference. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, the price differentials in mobile technology, um, you know, is striking. Now, I mean, some of it is going to be, you know, the types of phones. So what's, what's really interesting about the, the mobile phone market in Africa um, is the, uh, you know, the role of, you know, some of these, uh, um, of, well, Huawei is kind of, um, you know, kind of losing uh, market, share, market share to um, Transition, who makes the ITEL and the Techno brands. Um, and I think some of it is about just differential marketing. Of, um, you know, some is price differential based on um, kind of, you know, uh, purchasing power. But it, it's also worth considering, uh, you know, you know at these prices and purchasing power parity and, and data you know, may seem uh, cheap, but actually data in you know, Malawi, in Tanzania, is some of the you know, most expensive for users in the world as a, as, a, as a share of income or as purchasing power parity. Um, so um, it's expensive to use data. Now what's striking is in our study, we didn't, um, we, we saw that despite these constraints, you know, the smartphone, people found a way, you know, to kind of use the smartphone. Um, and uh, we, we, we gave a data voucher to some participants in Tanzania and we didn't, uh, we didn't strikingly see a difference uh, in use, which was, which was surprising to us, right? And once a, once a month data voucher for $5 uh, and we didn't see a, a difference in price suggesting those, and this was crossed across the phone group. So you know, some in the phone group didn't get this data voucher and that yet they found a you know, way to use it just as much. I do wonder, you know, there also might be a mechanical problem with um, the vouchers themselves and, and people not, um, you know, using them or it was just a, you know, they used it immediately and it didn't have any long term gain. Yeah, it's interesting. That question um, was linked to kind of what the question that I had as well about um, the difference in different contexts and the affordability mm -hmm. of phones in different contexts and how um, it, there's a tendency, I think, to kind of homogenize Africa as a yeah. continent and not recognize that there are actually very different um, telecommunications ecosystems yeah. in, in, in different 
uh, countries, and that that has a huge effect on the affordability of technology and how people use it. Yeah. And uh, that's very much linked actually to a question that we've just gotten from Nicole, uh, who's asking, uh, it would be interesting to hear about why you chose Tanzania specifically as the case, as opposed to other countries on the continent or elsewhere in the world. What is unique in your view about the cases that you chose? Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, yeah, because in many ways, I mean, also to your point, Kira, that you know, Tanzania is one of the, the advanced digital economies, uh, you, know, you know, one of the earlier to start with mobile money, you know, its, it's prevalence is much higher than say, you know, you know countries, um, you know, that are catching up like, you know, Nigeria and other types of markets, Malawi, where we're working now. So, uh, you know, we would expect to see stronger effects on mobile money in Tanzania. Um, you know, so it'll be interesting in Malawi, you know, whether we see is the, the consumption gains, the, the benefits for household living standards are as high. So how then do we uh, settle in Tanzania? Well, a couple of ways. One, um, I mentioned this social enterprise, Kadogo Kadogo, which was working in Tanzania. So we were connected to them um, and they were providing women with uh, phones, and that, women who didn't own phones in Tanzania working with them. So that was an opportunity uh, to, to evaluate the impact of their program. Um, so that was kind of the, you know, the vehicle there. Uh, and then um, our connection with Rapoa um, and Dr. Flora Mayamba, uh, who, you know, it, 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 you know the, those things aligned for us to, to work in, in Tanzania. Um, but, it, you know, it is, it is important to think about the, the cases we choose and to think about generalizability and we are cognizant that Tanzania has this advanced digital economy. That's why we're turning to Malawi, which which has less kind of, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's catching up. Great, thanks for that. Um, I, I think we've got time for probably just a couple more questions. Um, so another question that, that I had was uh, about the, um, the hesitancy that people demonstrated in taking up mobile money. Yes. Um, and I'm kind of wondering if uh, you could unpack that a little bit more, mm -hmm. if, or if you do know a bit more about that, perhaps from the more qualitative interviews that you did mm -hmm. uh, about where that um, kind of uh, lack of take up actually comes from. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for instance, I'm kind of wondering, is there a lack of trust, for instance, in mm -hmm. mobile money and, and mm -hmm. why that might be? Perhaps that isn't the issue, but I'm just wondering right. if you could yeah. talk a bit more about that. Yes, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, trust is so important when it comes to financial institutions. Um, and that's the thing about Kenya and Tanzania is there's just such high trust in mobile money. Uh, whereas in other countries like, uh, you know, Zambia, Malawi, it is slower to uptake. And so you don't have that critical mass of users. You don't maybe have that social trust in this institute, which it, it's coming, it's changing. Um, so what, yeah, so that was a striking thing is that it was that here, it does not seem to be a trust issue, right? Um, I think the friction came from, um, people not wanting this money to be tied up. They wanted it liquid, right? They wanted to have the cash in hand. Um, and the, you know, there are, there are, they knew that, you know, the, the, the cost of getting it out, of cashing out, you know, like the transaction, like the, the, the fee itself was, you know, the premium was much higher than the fee, but, you know, any of the transaction costs are more than the fee itself, right? It's going to an agent, it's getting to the agent, the agent has uh, cash on hand, you're able to get it out, you know, it's the transportation cost, it's the time. And I think um, they just preferred the cash in hand. So it really does point to, um, you know, that the you know digital financial services, uh, you know, individual use and uptake is going to be a function of the ecosystem uh, and the systemic level, right? If there's, uh, if you don't have, if you can't, you know, uh, use digital payments to buy food, if you can't use it for transportation, if you can't use it for other services, you're going to prefer cash, right? But as maybe the ecosystem changes. And, and, we're, and I think COVID, right, is just has, you know, transforming the ecosystem uh, and there's big, you know, big pushes for digital payments, then, you know, people will not think twice before, you know, to, to keep it on their phone and not worry as much about cash liquidity. Um, I think that was the big, you know, the big, the big concern. 
Okay. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. It's just, it varies really context to context, what, what the motivations are there. That's why I was uh, curious about that. And um, I think to kind of wrap up here, could you talk a little bit about the policy implications mm -hmm. of your research? Um, you know, you, you ended kind of with the big picture uh, takeaways and how that's obviously informing the next stages of the research project, certainly. Uh, and I'm just kind of thinking about uh, if, you know, if you had the ear and maybe you have had the ear of policymakers or um, perhaps even telecom operators, mm -hmm what are how would you apply the lessons that you've learned from from this experiment uh to improving policy around for instance mobile phone access affordability mm -hmm. distribution yeah. and potentially even issues like meaningful connectivity uh to to the internet right i think there are two big policy implications um that are relevant for telecoms that are relevant for development organizations governments uh, GSMA, you know, Tracy. I, th I think one is this this mobile turnover, right? I think we uh, we just don't appreciate it, or we just I don't know, shrug our shoulders like, oh, low income households don't, you know, they lose value as valuable assets. I mean, I think that's not good enough. That's not sufficient, and we have to think about how because the impact this has on programming is enormous, right? I mean, we we did another study in Tanzania with cash transfer beneficiaries who were were given a phone and SIM card and cash transfers. Um, at least 20% became disconnected. Uh, so they were doubly, you know, hurt. They didn't get the, they lost their phone and they lost the cash transfers. The cash transfers continue to be sent to these numbers and they're, they're just like lost in the, the black hole of the digital economy. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're, people are hurt by this. So we have to think about, um, can we do more to help people stay connected? Um, the, it's very onerous to get reconnected if you lose your SIM card, right? So if you lose your SIM card, you have to go to a, an official, let's say, a mobile network operator office. You have to present yourself, your ID. You have to know your SIM number. You have to know your PIN number. Sometimes you have to know the five people who you called recently. Uh, that's very, it's very ex difficult, you know, costly for people to do that. Now, there are good reasons, of course, we have to also be mindful of people's, uh, you know, um, you know, personal, their, their data security, um, we have to be careful of fraud. And I know people are taking advantage of kind of SIM loss to kind of uh, appropriate SIM cards, and, and we have to be careful of fraud. But we have to think, you know, we have to find a good, you know, maybe a better balance and, and think about outreach and support to low income users who are going to be hurt. The, the other uh, big takeaway is you know, the, the key when, you know, you know, digital literacy is so important. We all, we all know this and we're all, we're looking for how can we improve digital literacy, uh, especially among low literacy populations. And we're all, you know, you know, working hard on this. And, and we're, we're, we're often looking for technical solutions to this, this digital literacy, which is tough not to crack, right? What's fascinating to us is that the answer might be there in the household, right? Like, um, there are different digital literacy, digital literacy levels in the household, uh, and and our people and people do teach each other, and they turn to household members. How can we, you know, encourage that or, or facilitate that? I was thinking, Mark, I was really struck by the sons, right? The son effect when they take the smartphone and they, you know, they leave you know, their their households and their moms are like worse off because of it. Like, is there an opportunity for marketing campaign? by uh, mobile phone companies, governments, like, um, you know, let's help each other out. You know, let's, you know, let, let's teach each other, you know, as the frontier, you know, as smartphones are becoming, you know, much more um, common and used, like we need to teach each other. Uh, and we see this all the time, right? Like I help my parents all the time, you know? Uh, and, you know, I must say like, oh, it's kind of annoying, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, I think, the answers are there. And I think that cooperative use between husbands and wife, that happens, right? We, we I, you know, I don't know, maybe this is our own biases, but when I went in, I was like, you know, there's all con kinds of concerns about husbands. Oh, you're giving phones to their, you know, women. What about the husbands? The, the cooperative use happened, right? Husbands and wives work together partners. We shouldn't assume this anti antagonistic relationship, right? Um, I think sometimes we do have this prevailing view of an antagonistic relationship and, and we don't leverage the partnerships that exist 
in which people can teach each other, right? Uh, and that happens, uh, or we can encourage it, you know, and, and, and nudge, you know, nudge people to do so. We have to be mindful, you know, about backlashes that, you know, and so that's why in Malawi, we're really excited about this program because, you know, you know, we want, we see it a husband wife as a partnership. Can we tap into this to increase digital literacy? Um, and so, I don't know, it's an open question, something to be studied, uh, but, but I think there are ways we can do more, um, you know, to improve digital literacy from people, you know, from existing social relationships. That's great. Uh, thank you so much, Phil. On that note, I think we'll wrap up the webinar here. Um, it will be available on YouTube and, uh, and we'll put uh, further information about, uh, about the research that you all have conducted in the description there. So great. thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, Phil, thank you joining. so much, Kira. Uh, yeah, any follow-up questions anyone has, feel free to shoot me an email. Brilliant. All right, thank thanks. You. All right.